Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Experts of the Americas. I'm Isabel Chiriboga, an assistant director here at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. In today's episode, we will be covering the latest developments coming out of Ecuador's recently declared internal armed conflict against criminal gangs. The situation is quite alarming. Since January 9th, President Novoa has allowed the deployment of military forces to combat 22 criminal groups now considered terrorists. I'm delighted to be joined today by two distinguished speakers to dive deep into the issue. Juan Rivadeneira, who's a renowned Ecuadorian economist and political analyst, and someone who has been following the situation very closely on the ground. And Ryan Dubé, a Wall Street Journal reporter based in Lima, Peru. Since 2015, Ryan has been a correspondent in the Latin American Bureau, covering politics, economics, and businesses, among other topics. In addition to Peru, he has reported from Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, and other countries across the region. Juan and Ryan, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Ryan, I'd like to start with you. As I mentioned in the beginning, you've been covering Ecuador in the region for a couple of years now. Help us contextualize the situation. How did it get this bad and why? Sure. So just to maybe go back a little bit, um, in 2018, Ecuador had a homicide rate of about a little bit under six per 100,000 people, so lower than the United States, um, one of the safest in the region. Um, and at that time, Ecuador was seen as, you know, a success story in reducing homicides. Uh, we wrote an article about it, um, you know, how the police were managed to do so. Over the next, you know, five years, homicides have increased to, last year, there were 40 per, per 100,000 people. So they've just skyrocketed, really, since, um, since the end of the pandemic. Um, I think at the root of the cause of the problem is, you know, like a lot of problems in Latin America, is cocaine trafficking. It's been a big increase in cocaine trafficking, in cocaine production from Colombia, and that has um, a lot of that cocaine is now coming into Ecuador. Uh, so that has strengthened local gangs. It's brought in international players like Mexican cartels, um, European uh, organized crime groups, as well. Um, and these, so there's a lot more money, a lot more corruption occurring, a lot more drugs flowing through Ecuador. And those gangs are now starting to fight over the, the spoils of that, that, uh, that, you know, controlling that trade. So kind of the spike of, of the, the violence, uh, I think occurred back in you know, late 2020, just at the, you know, right, kind of right at the, I guess in the middle of the pandemic. And so when one of the gang leaders, um, he was assassinated in a shopping mall in the city of Manta. Um, and at that time, that gang really controlled much of the the, the drug trafficking in, in Ecuador. Um, that assassination led to a splinter of, of these gangs. Um, and there, you know, the first signs of the problems was really uh, a number of uh, massacres in prisons uh, where gangs, you know, basically prisons serve as the headquarters for a lot of these gangs um, in Ecuador where they control their activities from the inside. And from there, the violence uh, escalated. It, it moved into the streets, into, you know, it hits especially hard Guayaquil and other coastal cities. Um, and uh, it's, you know, the gangs are, fighting amongst themselves, but they're also fighting in, and targeting, you know, public officials, police, um, you know, fiscalists, uh, you know, prosecutors, uh, mayors have been assassinated. Um, a presidential candidate was assassinated last year. So anyone who kind of gets in the way of that activity, I think. Um, and, and it's just escalated from there. So I'm leading to the events over the last few days. Thank you. Thank you for that great context, Ryan. Um, Juan, as Ryan mentioned, you know, I think something that um, is really important is that the prison system seems to be out of control. So what's happening with the, with the people that the armed forces are detaining and where are they putting them? Well, um, first, the, the, the problem is rooted because Ecuador used to be a peaceful country uh, a few years ago. But the thing right now is that um, the country is a part of the path of the drug transportation around the world. And right now, even Ecuador is not a production country. It's a country where a lot of, of, of drugs are being moving through and going to different markets. That comes with the violence associated, but also with a lack of institutionality that the state has. So a lot of illicit businesses have been uh, are, are operating in Ecuador. For example, illegal mining, which is one of the problems, another, another of the problems where the drug money is going through. Now, 
all the detentions of the latest hours in the last 48 hours, we have more than 300 people that have been detained, accused of terrorist acts. Right now, they are going to some locations where I know in Ecuador we have a lot of uh, difficulties because of facilities, and the facilities right now are all uh, full. But right now they are going to that ways, and also to uh, the, the the first part, which is the judiciary, where they have to be accused, and with the process after that they have to go maybe to a jail. So that's one of the one of the reasons why the process is right now in that in that moment, and also the president has announced the construction of two um, of two jails that would be uh, in around 200 days maybe. And that's the first part of this decree because th this, this starts with uh, an executive order of the president of, the, of Ecuador, which states that the, the, the exception um, state and also the new decree, which was uh, uh, like in, in two, two days ago, and uh, it was on, on Tuesday. And basically it says that the uh, armed forces and the police have to identify the terrorists and also have to neutralize them. There's an order that has been quite polemic, but the the word, uh, the verb neutralize, it's on the decree and that will present a lot of escalation of violence here in Ecuador. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, I think very important points to, to mention and to help also contextualize the, the situation. And I want to turn it back to Ryan um, based on something that Juan said. You know, Ryan, intelligence report suggests that arms used by criminal gangs in Ecuador were coming from the Peruvian army. Meanwhile, there are over a thousand prison mates linked to the 22 crime, crime groups in Novoa's decree that are originally from Colombia and Venezuela and other countries in the region. What are some of the implications of this conflict being so intertwined with other countries uh, throughout the region, throughout Latin America? Sure. So, so yeah. Um, from what I understand, you know, some of the, the reporters who were, and, and you know, the media employees who were, um, who were kind of taken hostage on the other day on Tuesday, they said, you know, they they noticed on the arms that these, that the the criminals had, that the gang members had, that they seemed to have come from Peruvian army. There seemed to be an assignation on there. So that that's just the first time that we've seen this type of issue uh, in, with Peru. I mean, in, in Lima, there's been incidences, and in, in other parts of the country, there's been incidences where uh, police have seized arms that um, that seem to be coming from the armed forces. Um, so there's just questions about, you know, uh, just the control of the weapons that that Peru has, for example, and maybe other countries as well. I think more broadly speaking. Um, what this means for the region. I mean, it's Ecuador is kind of the latest country that's you know been intertwined with. And, and really hit hard and affected by, uh, you know, the, the organized crime, international organized crime, transnational organized crime, uh, the Mexican cartels, you know, the, the Colombian uh, uh, organized cr uh, crime as well. And I think, you know, it's, what this means for the U.S. as well is, is that there's been a lot more Ecuadorians leaving the country. I mean, this affects the the um, the economy. It affects the the sense of security, obviously, of people within Ecuador. And I think that is pushing a lot of people to leave. Uh, a lot more Ecuadorians are, you know, uh, heading north. And you know that if this situation doesn't get under control, then I mean, they can see a lot more as well. Great, thank you. Um, and you know, turning it back to to Juan, um, I think Juan, there's a big question that the government faces right now into how to finance the, the deployment of armed forces for a sustained period of time. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, Ecuador already faces uh, significant financial constraints because of its fiscal, fiscal deficit. Um, and Novoa just last night announced a decree that um, he wants to raise the VAT tax to cover some of these costs. Is that enough? What are some of the alternatives that the that the government is considering? Now, the 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 problem here in Ecuador is that insecurity has surpassed for a lot the, the power of the state. So there's right now no resources that can that can, that, that can fight this uh, this war right now and only the international cooperation would be the 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 the, the, the best solution for Ecuador. Um, recently the United States uh, the US State Department has been very vocal around supporting Ecuador, which is very important for us. There is a fiscal deficit that was go it will go five billion dollars uh, or more in 2023. There is a financial needs of more than 
10 billion dollars here in Ecuador for 2024. There's a lot of problems around uh, uh, underemployment, especially, and the lack of construction construction of new formal employers. So. The problem in the real economy is that you you cannot are not creating good and new jobs. So that's the problem of the economy. And now, why we have this sort of um, rel rel relatively uh, stability in, in the economy is because first we have the dollar as our currency. Second, because we have remittances coming from around the world. It has been a record number of $6 billion that Ecuador, near $6 billion that Ecuador has received uh, last year. And there is a lot of money when you cannot, uh, you cannot produce your money. You, need, you receive the, those remittances and are received by people usually that doesn't have a job or are uh, living in underemployment. And the other fact is because of households consumption, because of this money, and also because of the good and solid state of the private banking sector. That are the four elements why the Ecuadorian economy is still, you know, in this, even in having all this, this trouble is, is having a sort of way to get around. But as you said before, the president has said uh, recently, an hours ago, this uh, project of law, this new bill, that it will be treated in Congress around uh, raising the VAT tax, the VAT uh, uh, tax here in Ecuador, which is one of the lowest in the region, is 12 percent, and now is supposed to be uh, uh, rising until 15 percent. That is important because the cost of the pigs. Uh, the, the piece is, has, to, has to cost. So this is why the, the president asking Ecuadorians to go for a new uh, challenge in, in this uh, tax uh, rise. And also, I, I will like to repeat this, it will be very important international cooperation here to Ecuador, especially, you know, in, uh, with intelligence, with, uh, with weapons. The, the president has been very vocal yesterday, especially what he expects of the international cooperation and what he needs in order to get through this problem, because you have a big problem and lack of resources. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for that insightful answer. And I think this leads me to my final and last question um, to both of you, which I think it's important for us for us to hear. You know, we've seen historic levels of unity and unanimity in Ecuador during these times, particularly coming from the National Assembly supporting President Novoa's decision, but we still have a long road ahead. Um, how long do you believe this level of unity will last in the legislative power, given its politically fragmented nature? Uh, Juan, would you like to take that? Do, do, do you want me to go? Uh, I will say sure. that the, the 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 unity, and it's it's as you said, Isabel. It's like uh, you know, uh, historic to see this 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 you know this weather around unity. The problem is that we will have a general election in 2025. So when you have a general election in front, you know, there's a lot of competition and, you know, politicians are politicians everywhere, not only in Ecuador, and they will start to fight around because there's only one seat and everybody wants to have that seat, which is being president of Ecuador. And also there will be, because of a general election, it would be an election around the assembly members. So there will be in February, there will be called by the electoral authority, it will be called for the start of the beginning of the electoral year. So basically in weeks, we will start a, the electoral year and then you will have all the process around political parties and movements to qualify for the election. And then we will have the election around uh, February, 2025. So that means that a lot of people that would like to be candidates and would like to fight for the presidency or for a sitting Congress will have to start uh, as of today, maybe another of the reasons why President Noboa is also doing this, this, these actions is because he wants to be reelected. When he traveled as, as elected president to Washington and to New York, when he was elected president, he he was very vocal, saying that he will look, he will he will be looking forward to win a re-election, and he can. So basically, everybody is also. I know that they have. Uh, they are worried around security and the situation of the economy, but all the politicians here in Ecuador, including the president, are putting their, their eyes on the 2025 election. So basically, this unity moment, we need to, as Ecuadorians, we need to, 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 to use it as, as, as we can to approve new laws, 
to get a sort of consensus around society because the electoral times, uh, as winter is coming, electoral times are coming. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for that answer. Ryan, anything to add? Yeah, um, I would just add, you know, I think um, I think Daniel Pretanoboa probably has a short window of time to to demonstrate that his actions are working and that, you know, they're moving in the right direction, I think. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge. I think um, this, this situation has gotten so out of control over the last, you know, couple of years so quickly um, that it'll be very difficult to do so. Um, without, you know, you'll need that international cooperation, you'll need that international help. Um, and so, you know, it'll be upon the government and other governments to kind of work together. But also, you know, you need to tackle corruption, you need to get the prisons under control, um, and, and those other issues. So I think, you know, this this cooperation, it's, it's, um, it's, it's you know, it's, it's something to see at the moment, but I think um, there will need to be kind of results pretty quickly in order for, um, for it to be maintained. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you both for that incredibly insightful conversation and for sharing your expertise on the issue. Thank you to our watchers as well for joining us today and make, make sure to tune in into our next episodes of the Experts of the America series from the Atlantic Council.